thank you very much. Good morning and namaste to all friends and colleagues. I am very happy to be here and I thank the Institute of Medicine for this opportunity to share some ideas and experience and learn from your rich experience. I really appreciate this initiative and my organization, the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, which is a national union of almost two million workers in the informal economy, informal workers, is very pleased to be part of this dialogue. Um, I'm also happy to be here representing the Seva Promoted Lok Swasthya Health Cooperative, which is a cooperative, a grassroots level organization providing primary health care um, to informal workers like themselves. It's, it's a cooperative of informal workers. So when beginning to think about uh, sharing some ideas and experiences with you, I thought the best way would be go, to go back to a Mahatma Gandhi, many, many years ago, what he reminded us of. And what he reminded us of was to start with the poorest and the weakest. Think about them, and it's from them and from that experience that ideas for action will emerge. So today I thought I'd start by introducing you to two of my Seva sisters who are informal workers, Raji Ben Chavda and Fatima Ben Sheikh, both from the state of Gujarat, both informal workers struggling to make a living and also for a better future for their families. So let me start right away by introducing you to them. That's Raji Ben picking cotton in her fields. She's a small farmer and she and her husband own a small plot of land in the dry and drought prone area of Gujarat known as Viramgam. When the rains fail or when they're delayed, like this year, she becomes a laborer, a casual laborer. She breaks stones with, along with her husband to make streets, to make roads in the town nearby. Raji Ben is also a health worker in our Lok Swasthya Health Cooperative, along with 400 of her other sisters, who are all frontline primary care workers like herself. And she serves to provide health, basic health education, simple do's and don'ts, linkages with the public health system and for emergency and immediate referral care. Raji Ben also um, promotes and provides information on the national health insurance scheme that we just heard about, the Rashtriya Swasthya Bhima Yojana, which largely serves uh, below poverty line families in the country, and also Seva's own health insurance cooperative called Vimo Seva, which serves both below poverty line and above poverty line, because of course there are large numbers of workers who don't qualify for that category, but are still poor and vulnerable. Um, I'd also like to introduce you to Fatima Ben, who is a kite worker. She is from the city of Ahmedabad, that's her home city where she was born. And Ahmedabad, as some of you may know, is a city which celebrates the kite festival in India with much gusto. So here you see her making kites. Fatima Ben makes about a thousand kites per day, working as she does, squatting on the floor of her home, which is also her workplace. Um, and she earns about 120 rupees per day, or two dollars, which keeps her family fed and her children in school. Um, Fatima Ben suffers from heavy bleeding and the doctor advised a hysterectomy, but unfortunately she was not part of the national health insurance because she didn't qualify for below poverty line category and she can't afford to go to hospital and have this operation. Plus recently her daughter had an emergency appendectomy which cost about 15,000 rupees. They had no insurance, um, which is about I think 250 US dollars. Um, she is working hard to, to keep her family afloat. A few years ago, she joined Seva, and uh, now she has put her child in our daycare center, our child care center, so that she can go out and work more. And as she puts it, for the first time, I can bring dal and vegetables, lentil and vegetables, to feed my family uh, more, uh, feed my family properly. She's also heard about our Vimo Seva, our insurance cooperative, from a fellow kite worker who promotes insurance and actually gets an incentive and, and, and earns a supplementary living from it. And um, now she plans to join 
luckily our Vimo Seva Health Insurance soon. Raji Ben and Fatima Ben's lives mirror those of thousands of informal workers, not only in India, but all over the globe. In India, more than 94% of our workforce is informal, which is upwards of 430 million workers. Um, they are poor, they are hardworking, they work long hours. Large numbers of informal workers are women, and they do their best to provide food on the table and a better future for their children. Theirs is a lifelong quest for basic security in their lives, including work security and social security. In fact, our Seva sisters say work security and social security are two sides of the same coin. At Seva, by social security, we mean at least health care, child care, insurance, pension, shelter, um, including basic amenities like a tap and toilet in every home. I know for some of you that sounds quite basic, but but that's really where we're at still. Um, in India, a recent, uh, some studies have shown that about, it's estimated that about 60 million Indians fall into poverty each year due to sickness and health expenditure. A recent McKinsey Global Institute report, which I have here, I have the summary in case some of you would like to take a look at it. Um, this report on poverty in India calculated that about 680 million Indians or about 56% of the population are without basic services. And as you can imagine, health, water, and sanitation top the list. Out-of-pocket expenses in our country, just to give you an idea, account for about 67% of all healthcare costs. And again and again, every day as part of our daily work, we see with, you know, with great pain, we see that our people sell their land, their assets, a buffalo, a sewing machine, anything to keep a loved one alive. In our own Seva Bank, we have found that sickness is the number one cause for people taking out loans. Seva has promoted its own urban women's cooperative bank. And among the many reasons, over the years, and it hasn't changed, I must tell you, over the last 40 years, over the years we have seen that this is the number one cause for taking loans, medical care costs. Thus, we see repeatedly and across the country that people are trapped again and again into the debt and poverty cycle, which many of you are very familiar with. So addressing this issue through universal health coverage, UHC, is a major anti-poverty measure for us. And of course, it is well acknowledged now by policymakers, civil society, and the private sector. Ensuring and actually reaching UHC to all Indians, particularly the poorest and the most vulnerable, like informal workers, is, of course, uh, not a, a totally different matter. It's a huge challenge, given our large and diverse population. But act we must, and more and more people are coming together in our country, civil society, government, the private sector, the insurance industry, to try and see how this may be possible. I remember when Professor Michael Marmot, who was the chair of the WHO Social Determinants of Health Commission, came to India. He then met the Prime Minister of India, the then Prime Minister, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, and he said, if India gets it right, it will benefit all of humankind. Today, ensuring health care for all Indians is firmly on the national agenda. In 2000, November 2010, the Planning Commission of India instituted a small team to develop the architecture for UHC, and I was fortunate to be part of that team. And let me show you the definition of UHC that we came up with. You have to. Ensuring equitable access for all Indians resident in any part of the country, regardless of income level, social status, gender, caste, or religion, to affordable, accountable, appropriate health services of assured quality, promotive, preventive, curative, and rehabilitative, as well as public health services addressing the wider determinants of health delivered to individuals and populations with the government being the guarantor and enabler, although not necessarily the only provider of health and related services. I'll leave that up for a minute. As you can see, equity is at the core of this definition because we realize that the lack of access to health care is both a cause and a symptom of continuing poverty and exclusion in India. We also realize that while our government can play a crucial stewardship role 
it cannot and must not be the only provider of services. Many of you here who are familiar with the Indian condition know that in many states of our country, the state of public health services and systems is really quite abysmal, I mean non-existent. So the government will play a stewardship role, but what is envisaged is partnerships between government, private health care providers, the insurance industry, civil society and workers' organizations like SEVA, and citizens themselves in all parts of our country. Let me also show you the 10 principles on which we based the recommendations for UHC in India. Universality, equity, non-exclusion and non-discrimination, comprehensive care that is rational and of good quality, financial protection, of course, critical, Protection of patients' rights that guarantee appropriateness of care, patient choice, portability, and continuity of care. Accountability and transparency, which has also been already mentioned by uh, previous speakers, and consolidated and strengthened public health provisioning. Community participation, and I'll be speaking to this a little later, and putting health in people's hands. So these were the 10 guiding principles, um, and we had discussions with various groups across the country, all the stakeholders and groups that I've been mentioning, private, public, insurance industry, civil society. We also learned from many countries, many of you who are in this room are friends in Thailand and in Brazil and South Africa. And what we came up with is an essential package that will be a universal entitlement to every Indian citizen, a guaranteed access to an essential health package. We removed the idea of user fees, um, and so it will be free at the point of contact, including cashless, as you can see, inpatient and outpatient care, primary, secondary, and tertiary. There will be a choice of facilities, and people will be able to choose between the public sector and contracted in private providers, and I'll, I'll come to that. Um, a little later. I should also mention that since we've been discussing insurance, insurance, we see it as a support but not as a lead intervention. Insurance in this architecture that we recommended will be for the, um, the high cost and the low frequency events, illnesses, but it will not be used as the major mechanism or mode for various reasons. For one, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, is that we find that it drives up costs. For another, as I've mentioned, most of our people are in the informal economy. They don't have an employer at all, um, or at least not an identifiable employer. So collecting premiums, collecting contributions is not only difficult, but it's very expensive. Some, some of the costing that we have done, including for our own health insurance cooperative, is that sometimes the cost of collecting these contributions is more than the benefit, uh, in fact, that, that the um, patients receive. Also, we find in the Indian context, the health insurance schemes that have been developed, many of them have been developed in isolation from the health system, so there's fragmentation of the health system. There's no continuum of care. So, in fact, we do see, in many cases, unnecessary hospitalizations. And as many of you would have heard, recently um, there have been cases of hysterectomy indiscriminately being performed in some of the states under some of the health insurance programs. Of course, that's not the case everywhere, and there is evidence that it has also provided financial protection, and I'm sure other speakers will speak to this later on. So, again, insurance as a support, but not as a lead intervention. One of the major recommendations for UHC in India has been to increase investment to about 2.5% of GDP. Many of you will be perhaps surprised to learn that a growing economy like ours barely spends 1.2% of GDP on public health expenditure. Um, this, of course, leads to very high out-of-pocket expenditure, which I mentioned is about 67% at the current time. And our thinking is, or our hope is, um, and that's the way we, the architecture was created, that with 2.5% of GDP in, by 2017 and 2022, 3% or more of GDP, um, we'll be able to cut the out-of-pocket expenditure by about half to 33%, and hopefully prevent financial ruin 
of many in our country, including informal workers. General taxation will be the route for this. We debated this a lot, but finally, and we can discuss this later on, we chose general taxation as the route for funding this increased spending on health. Another key recommendation is the provision of free essential drugs as per the WHO's list. Um, drugs account for about 74% of out-of-pocket expenditure and drives families, well, to financial ruin. So what is envisaged is based on what several states have already experimented with, which is a system of free um, essential drugs, which will be available at primary, secondary, and tertiary care facilities, and also at contracted in, uh, wherever there's contracted and provided providers, uh, private providers, excuse me. Um, the other important point is that uh, we have suggested several changes in the drug policy in our country, both to promote uh, our very competitive indigenous drug industry and to make sure that affordable drugs actually reach uh, the last mile. As you can see, the third recommendation was that 70% of the enhanced expenditure should be on primary health care. And the cornerstone of that would be that at the local level, decentralized services available through a team, which would be nurses, uh, paramedics mainly, and also community-based doctors. There's heavy debate on that, and I must tell you the Medical Association has not been happy for various reasons, and we can discuss that later. Um, investing in human resources, particularly frontline workers, in the architecture we have proposed, most of the resources would go towards um, developing, educating, building up the capacities of local health workers and nurses and some doctors in states which are chronically deficient of doctors. We've also suggested a new public health cadre, and we got this idea from the southern state of Tamil Nadu, and some of you would be aware. It's the state which has many innovations in public health and good health indicators relative to the rest of the country. So this new cadre of public health professionals will be responsible for actually delivering the UHC, making sure it reaches, um, and putting all their energy into the public health approach. Um, we also are blessed with a large number of indigenous practitioners, Ayurveda, Yunani, and Siddha, our traditional systems. We have no shortage of those doctors. So the challenge will be, and we have recommended, how can we integrate them and use their knowledge and um, energies for UHC? Sorry. Yeah. A very important point, and I alluded it to alluded to it earlier was enabling community action for health. In a country as large and diverse as ours, one size does not fit all. And it's important for local communities uh, to have their own say in priorities, deciding what their health plans are, are and so on. And I'm happy to say that our government has accepted this idea in the main. So we now have, at least on paper at the moment, and hopefully in reality very soon, um, rural health committees and urban health committees where local people, elected people, representatives of women's groups, self-help groups, uh, local farmers clubs and so on would be part of these committees and they will have a small budget which they can then use for their own health priorities which might be getting food emergency rations to a malnourished child or garbage disposal. One of the surprising, uh, well, just before I go to that, one of the things that's very key, a key, key pillar, and a very difficult one, perhaps the most difficult, is the development of regulations and standard treatment protocols. Our country has the largest private unregulated health industry in the world. Not that our public is very well regulated. I mean, there's a need there for standards and quality control as well. But this poses a huge challenge and our government has put in some laws and legislations but in our system a federal system like yours it's the states that are the main ground for action and the states haven't yet um, developed the system of regulation but what we are looking to is developing standard treatment protocols and cost uh, sort of capping um, and obviously this is not going to be easy and we'd have to have much more discussion with private providers, public health providers and others so that we can move forward on this. 
But we are very clear that without this kind of basic regulation, it will be very difficult to provide any kind of UHC, public or private. The seventh point or recommendation is the development of urban health care. And surprising now, about one third of our people are urban, living in towns and cities, from mega cities to small towns scattered across the country. But we've had no framework and no service and very little infrastructure for urban health care. So this is a key point that's emerging in our vision of UHC. And what's envisaged, like rural areas, a whole lot of primary health centers and clinics, and that they will be the first point of contact, again, of course, free with essential drugs and so on, for um, urban people, urban folk. And they will go there, and then the screening, the early detection, and so on. And then only will they be referred to our large tertiary care hospitals, which at the moment, as many of you would be aware, are overcrowded, long lines, and, of course, the services suffer. Finally, and perhaps in some ways most importantly from our perspective, is an investment in the social determinants of health. Um, I already mentioned that we are a country that has not been able to unfortunately provide a tap and toilet, the basics in every home. It's known from the times of John Snow and the Broad Street Pump how critical this is. And in our own subcontinent 4,000 years ago in Mohenjo-Daro, they understood the importance of water and sanitation and had an elaborate drainage system. Yet this is something that continues to be a glaring gap in our country. I know this sounds like a lot. It sounds like a tall order. <laughs> and in some ways it is. I mean, we have to admit. But on the other hand, what we have seen in Seva and in India all these years is that if you don't take this kind of holistic and integrated approach, you know, it's not about a technological fix. It's about taking this kind of larger vision and a holistic approach to um, get uni universal health coverage to all citizens in the country. I just have presented a snapshot. There's a lot to say, and many of you would have questions. I just men mentioned some of the essential pillars, and we can talk about, um, we can talk about some of the details, if you like, later on. Our own experience of 40 plus years of organizing women in the informal economy, workers in the informal economy, and trying to get them to have some level of basic work security and social security supports this kind of approach, this holistic and integrated approach. But this is not the only thing, and there's still many gaps and things that we need to work on. And one of the major gaps is occupational health and safety. And that's what I'd like to focus on for the rest of my talk. As I mentioned, 94% of the workforce in India is informal, and at the same time, extremely economically active. These are not people who sit around. These are people who work night and day and contribute more than 50% to India's GDP and India's growth and prosperity. Yet, occupational health and safety has remained a very neglected area. We do have some services. We do have research institutes. But these have focused on the minuscule 6% of the formal economy. There are many reasons for this, one of which is that, of course, we have, in general, under-invested under as a nation in health care. And occupational health and safety has also suffered from that. Also, it's very difficult to organize informal workers. There are a growing number of organizations, I'm happy to say, but it's not easy. Informal workers do not come to a common factory or a common workplace. They are in the fields, they are on the seashores, they are on the street, they are in their homes. So organizing them, bringing them together, understanding their occupational health and safety issues, and putting that, those on the national agenda is no mean task. Also, we have a poor research and database. However, I think it's an area of action that is crying out for partnerships between workers' organizations like mine, between employers' associations, researchers, scientists, policymakers, and others like yourself. And in April 2013, we organized perhaps the first national workshop on the informal workers' health. Well, it focused mainly on women workers, and it was supported by WeGo, uh, Women in Informal Employment Globalizing and Organizing. 
a network of informal workers and organizations, researchers and policy makers of which my organization Seva is a founder. And WeGo was able to bring in people from South Africa, Brazil, Thailand, other countries who have also struggled with these issues and frankly have moved quite far ahead, have been able to develop uh, systems and services and integrate it with primary health care and UHC. So from this rich sort of debate which had workers, employers associations, ILO, WHO, people, high level po health policy analysts and makers, policy makers, what we found was the absence of a policy on occupational health and safety for informal workers. Now this may come as a surprise from such a large country which has made strides in so many other areas, but we found the policies that we had reflected the reality of barely 6% of the Indian workforce. We also learned from our own experience and we go that um, partnerships can be a very rich experience and a rich learning for all, particularly how to develop low-cost tools, equipments, processes, um, which not only safeguard the worker's health and make her life worth living, quite frankly, but also increase her productivity and income. And for her, that is critical. And so this first sort of dialogue uh, with partnerships and with people from all walks of life and different countries uh, then led to a nationwide process of consultation with unions, workers groups, again employers association, uh, government ministries. And one of the interesting things we found was that somehow occupational health and safety was seen to be the baby of the Ministry of Health and Employment. The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare had very little knowledge about the reality of informal workers. The Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Labor had till we had these national consultations, never sat like this across the table and figured out what they could do to reduce chemicals exposure and pesticide exposure and work together for that. Quite surprising, but that's the way it was. And the consultations were led by the National Advisory Council, which had the political punch. It's a, it's a, it was a group of civil society advisors to the then government of the day, and it was chaired by Mrs. Sonia Gandhi, who was then the chair of the ruling coalition government. So it had the political convening power and was able to draw people from all works of life uh, for this dialogue. The upshot of these discussions, um, I would just like to show you some of the recommendations. Maybe it's useful for our discussion. I think one of the major recommendations was first and foremost set up a task force to develop a policy. We don't have a policy that reflects the reality of the mass of the Indian workforce and the time has come to do this with all the kind of stakeholders I was mentioning across ministries. Not an easy thing to do, but has to be done. And the focus of the policy we suggested should be more on how to implement, how to reach the last mile, how to actually reach informal workers. Then developing a national database, and here's again where partnerships are required, pooling in whatever we know. It turns out we know quite a lot, but we don't know about each, each but doesn't know what the other is doing. And certainly informal workers don't have that information. So using what there is more effectively, developing a strong national database, then integrating occupational health and safety with primary health care and UHC, very important, and from this we learn from our colleagues from Brazil particularly how this can be done. It's not really rocket science. It needs, of course, more investment in OHS professionals, but it also means retraining and orientation of primary care workers, including paramedics, nurses, and so on, so they know to recognize um, some of the early symptoms and, and signs. Investment in education and awareness. The workers have very little knowledge about their own bodies, so body literacy and basic do's and don'ts, but also for the general public. Many of you who have been to India will be familiar that even wearing a helmet, uh, getting people who ride two-wheelers to wear a helmet is a major enterprise. Uh, people don't want to do it. So we have a, work, a lot of work to do, our work cut out, work in progress, if you will. Um, I mentioned what we did with the WeGo partnership and partnership with informal workers organizations of other countries, scientists and technical people in our own 
country, which is to develop tools and equipment. And later on in another panel, I'll be showing you some examples of this. But really, it has, we found that it increased the productivity of women so much, and it doubled their income, sometimes even trebled their income. Plus, it safeguarded their health. So here's an area that's waiting for partnerships and more action. Um, investing in human resources for OHS and training of existing health professionals, I've already mentioned. And the last um, recommendation we had was ensuring that there's an OHS lens. And before undertaking large development programs, whether it's mining or building big dams, that there should also be uh, OHS impact assessments, along with the routine environmental impact assessments that we do in India. So that's uh, what we recommended on OHS. Um, I would like to conclude my remarks by sharing what we've learned at SEVA over the years about working on health issues and the broader vision of OH, UHC and OHS, OHS and the special emphasis on informal workers and particularly women workers, who of course are a major part of the workforce but always remain invisible, undercounted, underrepresented. Um, all of us know that improving the health of workers and others in our societies is a long-term endeavor. It's no mean task. It needs action at both macro and micro level. But one of the strong learnings we have over the years is that without a strong base, an organized base of workers into their own democratic membership-based organizations, which are led by themselves, it's hard to see how all these recommendations would reach the workers and the last mile. Um, they're certainly not going to reach unless we have these strong organizations as intermediaries and as linking agencies. They will not reach the poorest and the most vulnerable in our societies. And in, in the case of India, women, minorities, Dalits like Raji Ben, minorities like Fatima Ben, the poorest of castes and communities in the Indian context that Gandhiji never ceased to remind us of years ago. The political economies of our villages and urban, urban settlements, the exploitative nature of work arrangements, the lack of essential services and basic social security, among other reasons, lead to the perpetuation of sickness, deprivation, and poverty in our experience. Thus, the struggles for OHS and UHC is closely linked to the struggle for justice, we believe, in the workplace and in society, and the struggle for gender equality, particularly for women workers, including within the family and in their homes. These barriers and hurdles, we believe, can only be overcome when people come together and build their own organizations, build their solidarity, and work for their own rights and find their own local solutions to their health issues and health problems, with the government and others of us being enablers and supporters. In our experience, health cannot be delivered. People can, though, however poor, come together and act in their own interest for their own health, whether it's deepening a well, ensuring that no child or woman is malnourished in their communities, and so on. Very importantly, we've learned at SEVA that frontline health workers that Raj, like Raji Ben are key. And this has been borne out by studies not only in India, but in many other countries. So the principle of people's health in people's hands has been incorporated in both SEVA's and also in India's overall conception and approach to UHC. What we've learned all these years is it's not the lack of resources but the lack of political will and our inability, actually, to develop strong partnerships and include all in the long journey to OHS and UHC. These continue to be the gaps which need bridging. Our country has acknowledged these gaps in policies at the macro level for UHC and is willing to engage. Yet another ripe atmosphere for partnerships. It has recognized that poverty reduction and health improvements must go hand in hand. Much greater investments are required for health and the social determinants, greater political will, and partnerships to meet the challenges 
of both OHS and UHC. We know now more than ever what we need to do. So let's do it together. Thank you.